on our third session. It might be that this will be uh, the most explicit explicit session. I will be using some explicit terms. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said that you cannot understand the benefits of decency without mentioning indecency and the harms of indecency. So I was trying to skip um, in the first session, in the second session, but hopefully all the explicit terms I had to use, it will be today, inshallah. So why I'm mentioning you this, so that if you have your kids under 12, then please make necessary adjustment, whatever is required, inshallah ta'ala. Do not come to me after Salatul Isha, or even before Salatul Isha, that Imam Asif, I was sitting with my kid, and what kind of language you were speaking, I'm just giving you warning. Um, I didn't bring my kids, uh, so I'm just telling you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, most likely they will be exposed to these terms in their school, um, most likely on internet, but wallahu alam. Okay, let's just start this, inshallah. I will be discussing four things today, chapter two and chapter four from my book. Uh, I brought three books, those of you who are interested, you can get it, inshallah. Okay, let's just start this, inshallah. Um, we will be discussing three different paradigms. One paradigm of gender identity, one paradigm of sex itself, and one paradigm of sexuality. These three paradigms. And fourth, we'll be discussing sexual revolution, which came in the West, and then it became basically global movement around 1960s. So four things. Let's just start with the sexual revolution. Then we'll understand those three different paradigms, Islam and modern gender identity paradigm, or postmodern paradigm, Islam and modern or postmodern paradigm in terms of sex, and then third in terms of sexuality. Let's just start this, inshallah, with the entire modern or postmodern sexual revolution around 1960s. <coughs> I don't know whether I said this last time, subhanAllah, we are living in a time where a um, few decades ago in West, do you know that homosexuality was considered as illegal under sodomy law? And now, within a few decades, what have happened, that now it's not only considered as a legitimate act, legal act, but actually it's considered as part of my identity. So there is a moral justification for it. Back in the days, people used to engage in the act of gay and lesbian. Now, people are gay. <laughs> Did you see the difference in the language? Previously, it was an action which was illegal in the West also. And now they are gay. Now it's much above and beyond the action. It's our identity. And that's what we'll discuss today, inshallah ta'ala. How did this start when we have in Western countries also, we were very conservative. It means people here in the West were conservative. Some, some people think when, when you come back, when we come from Pakistan, Saudi, Yemen, Somalia, Jordan, when you do the migration, you're going to think America was always nude like this. No, it, it was a very conservative country. In fact, I was just dis discussing this with Dr. Khal Sharif uh, Tubli, a professor in Brandeis, and he was giving me some shocking statistics. He was saying that Harvard, Harvard University, was actually a male-only university. You know this. Just Google it. And their female department was actually Radcliffe University. Same professor would teach to brothers only Harvard. And then he would go for the same lesson to the Radcliffe for the sisters only class. This is Massachusetts, America, less than 100 years ago. One girl from Radcliffe was expelled because she was found sleeping with the guy in Harvard. The issue of consent was not there. But just because it was such a conservative society, how can you engage in the premarital relationship? She was expelled from Radcliffe. And this is in America and Massachusetts. What happened all of a sudden? That first casual sex or lawless sex or premarital relationship became norm and normative practice. Then slowly and gradually homosexuality became norm and normative practice. And now trans ideology and now bestiality <laughs> that a person can have a relationship with the animal you know this is a thing in some states it's still not illegal by the way until last year in hawaii and new mexico it was not illegal to have a relationship with animal one ayah should come in your one before we can even start if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't give you divine light, 
then there is no light for you. Once you remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala officially from your sexuality, then you will going to do all these things to try the meaning of life. But you are not getting the meaning and objective of life from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be lost like a blind camel in a dark desert. Okay, let's start this inshallah. So how, how we have reached to this point in, in Western country, there was a term called sexual revolution. You can Google it to know more about it. I have actually an entire chapter you can read in my book, Sexual Revolution. What is this sexual revolution? By the way, before I can start, we can edit this inshallah. Tell me what comes in your mind when you think about sexual revolution? Brothers or sisters, tell me what comes in your mind. Yes. Yes. So birth control pill, you went exactly to the technology which initiated the movement or momentum of birth control pill. Some people have misunderstanding, sexual revolution, so they will think, oh, it's actually about transgression in sex, like porn industry. Obviously porn in internet came later, but Playboy magazines and all those started earlier. So they think, oh, actually sexual revolution mean, means transgression in sex. No, we are not talking about that. It's not only that, yeah, it is. It's not only that, because there were shameless images in the ancient art. It's not only about homosexuality, because people used to engage in same-sex behavior even before the sexual revolution. When we are saying what sexual revolution is, first of all, is the invention of the birth control pill, and I will come back to this, it gave the rise to the sexual liberation. So birth control pill came, now, hooking up, casual sex, lawless sex became easy, became safer. Back in the days before the birth control pill, at least women used to fear the consequence. The guy can go away, but women have the fear that, okay, I have to bear this responsibility. But now she can take a pill. Divine guidance is already thrown out of the window in the West. The social consequence is being taken care of by the birth control pill. So now, when you say sexual revolution, it means few things. First, sexual revolution means that it's not only transgression in sex, as I said. Sexual revolution means that you will be identified with your sex. That's the first thing. So if that's a sexual revolution, you'll be identified with your sex. Second, second thing, that there will be no social stigma if you will engage in casual sex. So now, if you were going to say zina is haram, you are basically basically saying you are judging you are judging zani, and you are being too judgmental. Maybe his heart is clean. Who knows? So don't say zina, zina zani is bad. Or liluti means the person who is engaging in the act of livat, which is homosexuality, is haram because you are judging him. Because morality thrown out of window, how you can decide what is good and bad? Don't judge people. So there is no social stigma of whatever people are doing, let them do. This is second thing in sexual revolution. Before 1960, these things were considered at least at the social level in the West, haram. Social level, I'm not talking about religiously haram. But that is thrown out of the window. So no social stigma, no shame, no embarrassment in premarital relationship, in casual sex, in lawless sex. Second, you can identify yourself as a sex instead of engaging in the sex and third thing that if any outside morality is stopping you from the sex if any outside morality including religion is stopping you from sex that should be abolished because we live in an individualism if people want to pray they can pray no one can stop them they can come to masjid and if they want to have sex in whatever way they can we should not stop them that's the mentality of the west now when you come to from the islamic angle from the Islamic angle, we cannot accept this paradigm and I will tell you why. But this is what sexual revolution is. So someone ask you what sexual revolution is? Before we can start the paradigm, it means three things. Can anyone repeat? What are those three things? Identify. Once, identify yourself with your sexual feelings. Second, hmm? so no social stigma, no judging. You cannot judge Zani. You cannot say fornicator is... Uh, fornicator is a bad person or the person who is committing adultery is a bad person because there is no objective definition of good or bad in the West. That's a sexual revolution. And third, abolishment. abolishment of any outside morality which stops you from fulfilling your sexual desire. 
Is that clear? Before we can move to the paradigm, I want to tell you something about the hypocritical nature of this sexual revolution. Remember these three things. And I will going to discuss something very sensitive about incest and pedophilia and cheating and infidelity. Please uh, pay attention to this now. Let's see the hypocritical and conflicting nature of the sexual revolution. So sexual revolution is basically breaking down the morality which goes against the sexual desire. So that basically a person can fulfill his sexual desire or her desire without any morality. But you will see in the West where homosexuality is considered now legitimate, is still they would limit certain sexual activity, which is incest. It's illegal, at least for now. <laughs> at least for now. We don't know how it will go, but incest. What else is uh, from the sexual behavior is illegal in America? Uh, polygamy, we'll discuss that, very good. What else? Bestiality, uh, uh, remove four states. Um, New Mexico, Hawaii, there are two more. But apart from that, it's illegal. What else? Pedophilia, right? It's illegal. Okay. Now the question is, before we can even start and see the loopholes in this, the question you might ask to a postmodern is, that you are saying abolish all the morality so that individual can fulfill his or her sexual desire, right? But then why you say homosexuality is fine, but incest, or pedophilia, polygamy, or bestiality is haram? Means if they are, if they are just fulfilling their sexual desire, then if they are finding their true self, let them find their true self also in incest and pedophilia. Then they have to come up with a response and they would argue that, no, that is haram because of few reasons. Anyone know those reasons? Huh? Yeah, so no harm. No harm principle. They would say, no, in incest and in pedophilia, you will harm someone. And I'll, I'll explain how they define harm. And second is consent. Consent. There is no consent and no harm. So now let's take a deeper look about the consent principle and no harm principle before we can discuss those paradigms because it's very important, logical consent. But before that, did you see what this Western society civilization did to us? Sex and sexual behavior in and of itself does not carry any moral significance. It is actually the consent or not to consent will going to make it a legitimate act. So there was a sexuality and morality are not connected at all, even in incest. But it's the issue of consent, not the sexual behavior with the relative. That's what West have done to us that sex and morality are different. Now let's start logic of consent. There are inconsistencies and in subjectivity how they define cons um, consent. Let's start with the pedophilia one. So in pedophilia, if you will ask, um, why, why is pedophilia bad while homosexuality is good? If you will ask them, they will say, first of all, you will see that they would use the consent and no harm argument, but basically it's just a matter of taste. Nothing else. It doesn't matter how they feel. Right now they are feeling pedophilia is bad. After five years, it, if it will be good, they will try to make loo loopholes and they would say that actually it's fine. So they would say pedophilia is bad because it's an abuse by an adult and he's harming the child. And how can you seek consent of the child? You will abuse your power. The consent, if you will seek it, will be speculative. So basically, no consent and harm, right? When an adult is doing this with the child. A counter argument, we are still saying pedophilia and says everything is haram, but we are saying how inconsistent you are. Just a counter argument that if an adult in the family cannot go, or if an adult person cannot go against the consent of the child, then I as a father cannot even raise my kids because we go against the consent of our kids all the time. Our kids doesn't want to go to school in the morning. We have to discipline them and we have to go against their consent. Sometimes discipline them so that push them and force them so that they will go to school. We are going as a parents against the consent of our kids all the time. Now the question is why sexual behavior is an exception? Not to eat this. Dietary habit control. We do this all the time as a parents. Going against the consent of the kids. And this is, in all the things you will see, they have considered sex as an exception. They would say for other things, it's workable, but for sex, it's an exception, exceptional situation. 
And that's the gift of postmodernity and Sigmund Freud and Wilhelm Reich. We'll discuss some other time, inshallah. No harm principle, that an adult cannot do this with the child because there is a harm. Well, when a parent cheats on his wife, when a father cheats on his wife, he is engaging in an inappropriate sexual behavior, which will, because of this cheating, the kids will be harmed, right? So because of his sexual activity, kids will be harmed, but that is not considered a super haram. So there is a harm. There is the consent discussion, but you have just the matter, you have just made this as a matter of taste. When the taste will change after five years, you will say it's halal. There are inconsistencies. Second, why is incest permissible? Why is incest prohibited when homosexuality is good using the consent rule? Science, but they say even consent. So they would say consent and no harm, and they might bring this um, um, argument of the science, even though, even though. There are researches now that, okay, you can do the test and maybe it's... But now, let's, let's apply their principle. Let's apply their principle. You are saying with consent and no harm. Consent and no harm is the principle. So let's apply this. If two adult, if two adult consensual siblings using contraceptives and engaging in sexual behavior, then there will be no, and with consensual and no harm, because they are adult and they have given consent to each other and they are contraceptives, so there's no need of basically thinking about harm, then none of these principles will apply. Did you see that? And that's why subhanAllah people are discussing now. Alhamdulillah it's not coming, but people are discussing about pedophilia and incest now. By the way, now the question to the postmodernists, you are saying incest and pedophilia is haram. Why don't you let them try this also? Just let them find their true authentic self. Why you are restricting this only to homosexuality? So it's just a matter of taste. It's just a matter because once you remove divine guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَمَعْنَهُمْ in nur. Then there is no guidance for you, man. Okay. Extramarital affairs. Okay, first of all, I was, subhanAllah, I was giving this talk yesterday in New York. And one, subhanAllah, sometime talking to non-Muslims is easy then. Some liberal postmodernist Muslim. So one young individual, he came and he was justifying for LGBTQ. Um, and he was saying, uh, why consent is okay, your logic doesn't work, and so on and so forth. So I said, Habibi, tell me, is cheating your spouse, infidelity, is appropriate or inappropriate? Guess what? He's a Muslim. He said, it's appropriate. I said, okay. So can I ask your wife to cheat? And still pin drop silence right now? It was like that. Why we have the means you if you want to win a debate, <laughs> come. Even infidelity, even cheating is considered as illegal in most of these states. Massachusetts, Florida, Minnesota, Arkansas. Just name just Google it. Either few months in jail or in if you are in Massachusetts, one year in jail with financial burden. And even if it's halal, we would still consider it haram. But I'm saying now the problem is if two adult consensual adults are doing something, then with consent and no harm principle, this should be fine. Two adults with consent are doing something, then these principles are saying it should be fine. Then why it's haram? And now the further question, how many of you know our president Bill Clinton? You know how he, why he was impeached? Why? Their sister Monica, sister Monica, and Bill Clinton. Sister Monica was the intern, and he did something. And she also did something. And she, now, the question is, if, in, if this is fine, she said, it's reported from her, just Google it, that it was consensual relationship. It was consensual relationship. If two adults, consensual relationship, then why the scheme need to be impeached? Tell me, why? You are making these rules, Westerners, and you have impeached your own president. Means, <laughs> eventually your fitra will come out. <laughs> eventually. And by the way, uh, it's a later story that in 2014, Monica took a U-turn, and Sister Monica said that um, it was not actually, um, uh, she said it was an inappropriate abuse of authority and privilege, 
uh, as an intern working in the president, my consent was speculative. In 2014, she changed. And that's by the way, again, telling you how many loopholes in consent principle of the modern day society that now, um, after 15, 20 years, um, anyone can come and basically, and now they have launched the forms. It's so, so, so much subjective that actually social scientists are discussing what, if, what, what will happen if you were going to take your consent back just before one microsecond of ejaculation? What will happen at that time? It's, once you remove guidance, once you remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your life, you cannot invent, invent these things. Then you will be stuck in just all these issues which are told by the religion for, and guided by Allah and His Messenger. Okay, why is polygamy considered as haram? Why is polygamy considered as illegal in America when two adults, consensual adults, with consent, with no harm, protecting and preserving rights of each other, they can have relationship and if these are the only principle, consent and no harm. Why? Any idea? It is because even though Western, modern, postmodern, let's say, we don't give any regard to religion, but still, they carry over morality from Christianity. They carry over morality from Christianity. It's a, it's a cultural baggage. If you are in Pakistan, you will see the baggage of the Pakistani society in Islam, similarly Saudi and similarly in America. These people, even though they say, no, 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 we are not following any religion, but they are following the baggage of Christianity and they will borrow the morality from Christianity. In Christianity, is it a monogamy is permissible or polygamy is permissible? Monogamy is hardly permissible. <laughs> Even if you become pastor, monogamy is not permissible. It means the maximum which is permissible is monogamy. So for that, obviously, they will going to show their inconsistencies, loopholes, even narrow-mindedness. And they will label you that you have lack of tolerance and uh, narrow-mindedness. This is what's basically to expose you how sometimes we can come into the idea that, oh, consent and no harm. First of all, how do you define harm? We discussed this last time. Last time. It's not only physical harm. But even those principles, there's so many loopholes, so many loopholes. Okay, let's just start. By the way, final thing before we can start those paradigms. Why this sexual revolution spread like a wildfire, first in the West and now in basically the global world? Tell me. That now everyone is having the discussion of premarital relationship with no social stigma. Tell me, how did it spread? Any idea here? Secularism, very good. Sex became the purpose of life. Sex became the purpose of life, according to Sigmund Freud. He exactly said, said the same thing. It's the highest objective and happiness of life that you just engage yourself in sexual behavior. First of all, the contraceptive pill came, birth control pill came. Second, media, media, porn industry, Playboy magazines, all those things. Um, and third, Hollywood celebrities would consider this as cool that you are engaging in premarital relationship. Okay, when you think about Beyonce, Cardi B, Justin Bieber, what else? Lady Gaga. Come on, I'm running out of names. When you think about them, do you think about a modest individual who is following the biblical morality or the Quranic morality? Or you are thinking about someone who is just sleeping randomly with fans? What do you think? Looking about their outfit, they are promoting this premarital relationship, lawless sex, or they are conserving the traditional family system of the sexual behavior. Tell me. We know this. So even with celebrities, what they are promoting with the Hollywood, this is now spreading like a wildfire. Uh, and even though they say that you should not judge anyone whether they are engaging in the sex with a spouse or premarital relationship, but if you will say, if you're sitting in the university, U U UTD, right? That's how you're saying, UTD? UTD. And if a, a random miskeen Muslim guy, Abdullah, says that, Alhamdulillah, I'm 19 years old and I'm married. What the liberals in your class are going to say? <gasps> so young to get married. But you said that consensual adult, no harm, everything is fine, man. But then again, 18 year old, 17 year old says, by the way, I'm Samantha, and he's my boyfriend, Matthew, or he's my boyfriend, Susan, let's say. And then people will celebrate. Oh, you came out of closet, you are so brave. There is inconsistency because you see religion from the adversarial lens. So Allah uh, this is a problematic. And then 
the rhetoric of the third wave of feminism, that also didn't help. That I have control over my body, that's a third wave of feminism, just built in this idea. And obviously this entire, that men can go after this relationship, I have to bear the responsibility, this birth, birth, birth control pill came, and this lawless, lawless sex became a widespread, that I, I have to raise a child, um, and then again, mainstream media, Hollywood, Netflix TV show is just not helping to remove the social stigma. Okay, now the three different paradigms, inshallah. I, uh, I hope we can finish this tonight, inshallah. This is mentioned in chapter four. First paradigm, and again, you just have to, because we don't have PowerPoint. This is Islamic paradigm, and this is, that's a modern paradigm. Actually, three things we have to bring it here, okay? Okay. So in Islam, try to listen to this carefully. In Islam, we say these three things are connected together under divine guidance. I haven't tell you what these three things are. But in Islam, we say these three things are connected together. And you cannot do one of these things at the expense of other. These three things have to come together. Okay? And they are connected under divine guidance. Modern or postmodern paradigm, they say that these three things are disconnected. They cannot be connected. What are these three things? Sex, reproduction, and marriage. Islam says sex, reproduction, and marriage, they are connected. So for Islam, appropriate sex would be before marriage or after marriage? With a spouse or with anyone? Only with a spouse after marriage. Yes, you can use birth control and the entire debate of birth, uh, debate of birth control abortion. That's different. The, our perspective is different than Christianity. I'm not going there. But eventually, by default, by default, should not be abortion. By default, should be reproduction. Otherwise, society will become dysfunctional. So you would say it's haram unless there is a genuine need. You can go back and check with your scholars, but not for zina, for the medical need or anything. Because most of the American abortion are happening because of zina. So don't bring fake discussion and just legalize the American concept of. Uh, abortion but anyway so reproduction marriage and sex this is connected in islamic paradigm now when you see their paradigm so premarital relationship become haram because you are not doing this you're not keeping these three things together extramarital thing same thing when g and g get married gay and gay g and g let's say can they reproduce no so this for us we don't even need this paradigm i'm just using this language so that i can talk to them for us it's enough allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says just remember this but i'm just talking to them in their philosophical language the see we are producing civil damage root reproduce no uh, i'll give you an example i was um, uh, talking to one of my friends he was saying subhanallah if you leave 100 transgender men 100 transgender men and 100 transgender women in a desert, after 100 years, what will happen? You'll only see skeletons, nothing else. And then you will leave 15 men and 15 women in a desert, after 100 years you will live, you will see a thriving community, right? Especially if they are Muslims, <laughs> right? Especially. Why? Because it's unnatural, it's that simple. Okay, let me tell you this. Now, what happened in the modern paradigm? What happened in the modern paradigm? In modern paradigm, they disconnected, by the way. Now, modern paradigm, first of all, do they believe in any religious divine morality? No. So divine morality, so these three things were connected with divine morality in Islam, they throw out of the window. Now, in 1960s sexual revolution came, it caused birth control pill, right? Birth control pill came, it disconnected sex with reproduction. So first thing was broken. That now from reproduction, sex became recreational. Are you following brothers and sisters? Second, how it disconnected with marriage? They were not afraid of God when they were not doing zina. They were just preserving these social values. Social values, oh no, I'm protecting myself for my spouse, it's good. Because it's reason. But now in postmodern world, you don't even consider reason. Revelation is thrown out of the window. And now entire focus is on feelings. 
So marriage, family, reproduction, technology, everything is supporting. So sex became, sex became a free floating variable. Is this connected with reproduction? Is this connected with marriage? And divine guidance is already thrown out of the window. Now the question comes, now the question comes, that how do they define appropriate and inappropriate sex? For us, it's after marriage with the spouse. How do they define appropriate versus inappropriate sex? Tell me. Consent. Because they have to define sexual harassment, right? So they would say, if you do sex with consent, with no harm, it's appropriate and legal. If you do it without consent, and we just discussed the subjectivity of the consent, it's illegal. Whether it you're doing with your spouse, with someone else's spouse, that's how it is, right? Before marriage, after marriage, same sex, opposite sex, in some states with animal. I don't know how you get consent of the animal. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, but as long as consent and no harm, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, now the, there are a few issues with this, few issues. And we have discussed few issues already. But now, what we have done with this. First, now, after disconnecting sex, sex with reproduction and marriage, now sex became free-floating variable. For the young people in the college, it becomes fun, romance, love. That's it. For the marketing people, how many of you have taken marketing management course in the college? I've taken one, marketing management. And my teacher used to say, remember this rule of thumb, sex sells. And then you will see marketing strategy, whether it's YouTube, media. This is reality. This is reality. So marketers will see the sex to sell their commodity. Young people will see this to manifest fun and love because it's disconnected with marriage. It's disconnected with reproduction. And we have these two different worldviews within our heart. One is Islamic worldview, one is modern, postmodern worldview. When you are looking at any Muslim characteristic or Muslim, let's say, Miss Marvel, or any Muslim celebrity in Hollywood, Netflix, or even Bollywood, films of Bollywood, Will they cover the relationship between man and woman from Islamic paradigm or from the modern paradigm? Modern paradigm. And we are consuming that information, that filth and that garbage in our Islamic paradigm and we are mixing the information. And that's one of the other problems we are having in current society because predominant culture is the modern culture. So this is the first issue which, um, um, is, which should be clear. Which should be clear. There's a thing called replacement ratio. Have you ever heard this? Replacement ratio? What is replacement ratio? Who will tell me? Yeah, tell me. So if, if uh, me and my wife, we are two, we need at least two kids to replace us. So two is basically the break even. Otherwise population will go in decline if it's less than two, right? So there is a problem in Europe and in the West of replacement ratio now. In European countries, it's 1.6. And it looks like that it will go further down because of the situation right now. By the way, there are statistics, empirical data, that um, nowadays people are engaging in a less sexual relationship as compared to 10, 20 decades ago. Marriage is difficult. You have to beg your, means I'm talking about mainstream American, you have to beg your partner after six months of begging to sleep once, and then she will going to sue against you so that she can eat for five years and then vice versa. And then once you are married, once you are married, you both protect and preserve the rights of each other. You can engage in the relationship and Islam considers that as an act of Ibadah. So generally when marriage becomes difficult, zina will increase. But on a flip side, the relationship in terms of it will going to decrease. It will going to decrease. And that's what's happening, subhanAllah. And that's why there is sexual chaos in our community. People are trying all different things. Um, okay, now the second, the second paradigm. I want to finish this today because I don't want to bring the explicit discussion next time. Just last two paradigms. Next paradigm between Islam and postmodernity is this. Who will quickly repeat what was the first paradigm? Sex, reproduction, marriage or family. They are connected in Islamic paradigm. Modern with modernity would say they are disconnected. Okay. Now second paradigm, and now listen to this carefully because this is related to gender identity, or even homosexuality, I would say. In Islam, we would say they, there are three things which are separated, inverse relationship. Second paradigm says in Islam, there are three things which are separated. 
and modernity and postmodernity put those three things up together. What are those three things? In Islam, we say your feeling, your feeling, your action, and your identity, they should not be connected. Your feelings, your action, your identity, they are not connected. Postmodernity would say your feeling are your action and that's your identity. I'll give you an example quickly. Give me any example of any sin. Drinking zina. If, if you are getting the feeling for zina, as a Muslim, should you act on it because of just because of the presence of that feeling? Or should you just check the Quran and call the Imam of the Masjid? Uh, is it halal or not? Let's say if you don't know about zina, is it halal or not? Your feeling, the simple presence of your feeling should not lead to an action because you have a filter of sharia. Is it halal? Is it haram? Right? If it's halal, you will go for it. If it's haram, then you should not go for it. If you will see a brother or sister doing zina, will you as a Muslim advise them do tawbah and leave zina? Or will you as a Muslim brother or sister will say, you are doing zina? How cool you are. That's what who you are. You are Zani. Laws should be changed for you because now your identity is Zani. You feel that way. You were created that way. How can loving Allah say, Wala taqrabu zina? Allah needs to change His words. What will be your behavior? Your response will be, No, do tawbah. Leave zina. Zina is haram, right? That's not what your identity is. But now the postmodernists will come and they would say, So basically, Islam is a feeling, actions, identity cannot be connected. Now let's see the postmodern. Postmodern will come and they will say, if you have a feeling for something, go for it, Habibi. <laughs> because that's what who you are. You should act on it. You should be yourself. You should find your true, authentic self. And if you are having that feeling, even if you acted on it or not, that's what who you are. You are gay. Let's take a quiz, you are gay or not. Have you seen that on YouTube site? How many of you took that? <laughs> okay. Because some of you said yes. So answer. Okay. Those of you who said yes, please see me after Isha. Okay. But now you are created in that way. And you know what does it mean? If you identify as a gay, then it means anyone who is saying gay is haram, it means it's going against your existence. Let me give you an example. Someone might ask me, by the way, this, this question is usually asked. Imam Asif, what's the problem? Uh, the, we are praying in INT Masjid Maghrib and Isha, no one is stopping us. So if two people are doing something, whether homosexuality or eating samosa, what's the problem with it? They are acting on their feeling. What's the problem with it? I said, there's a big problem. Let's see one by one. And I'll tell you how identity paradigm. Never accept identity paradigm. Brother and sister, never accept identity paradigm. Okay, let's start one by one. I gave this example of car that you are driving. Let's just start with that. If you are driving at 150 miles per hour, cop comes pull you over, and you will say to the cop, I can actually drive 150 miles per hour, don't give me a ticket, because I'm feeling like a fast driver. And I identify like a fast driver. And if you are saying I cannot drive because of the laws, it means these laws are made to deny my identity, to deny my existence, because I was created that way. I drive fast. And you are a hater if you are stopping me. You are a bigot if you are giving me ticket on this. Does it make sense? Furthermore, you might say, no, fast driving, Imam Asif, you know what? Fast driving can potentially harm someone. And that's the argument. Cop will give you ticket, and he will say, you're fast driving, even though you're feeling like a fast driver, even if you are identifying like a fast driver, but we need to restrict your feeling, restrict your freedom, restrict your choice of fast driving so that you cannot harm yourself or harm others, right? But now someone will say, no, but what if two people are doing something in private, in closed door, they're not even coming in the road. What about that? There's no potential of harming you because the way they define harm is only physical harm. You know this, right? You say, still we have a problem with that. If two people are engaging in inappropriate sexual behavior, then ask them, is infidelity and cheating haram? In Islam, absolutely. But even in American society, is it bad? Ask them. And if they say no, 
Tell them, let me bring your wife and then ask you. Because for being cool, they were going to argue, oh no, 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 because they have to prove their point. Imam Shafi says, you can never win a debate with a jahil person. <laughs> so, then ask them, if I am married to someone, and if I'm sleeping with someone else, because two people are doing something with their consent, it's not harming, it is harming. It is harming my family, my nuclear family is broken. How many kids are homeless? Remember I told you fatherless last time? 1.9 million kids. 63% kids commit suicide, those are fatherless. 87% are dropouts from the school are fatherless. If you restrict the sexual behavior in the private room, we would have better numbers. And that's why we say, whether it's public or private, zina is haram. Liberal might say, rape is haram, but zina is not haram because if two people are doing something in private, why it's bothering you? We say no, still, it's harming society. Is that clear? This is extremely important. Feeling, action, identity. When a person comes to you and says, even in the Muslim community, if someone comes to you, someone asks me, one sister asks me this question, if someone comes with a real same-sex attraction, how will you deal with it? First of all, tell that it's feeling, not your identity. You're not born gay. You're born as Abdullah, Habibi. You're born as Fatima. You're not born gay or born lesbian. Is that clear? It's just same-sex attraction. I have attraction for like heterosexual person. We will have attraction for the opposite gender, right? And if I will be patient, when I will see an attractive opposite gender, will I will get the reward? Absolutely. Similarly, if you are having same-sex attraction, inshallah, be patient. Don't change the laws of Allah. Control on your feelings, you'll get reward. That's how you should deal with it. But do not accept identity hoax or identity paradigm. Born that way, and then that's it. You are in their territory. Okay. <clears throat> Last thing, inshallah, before, last paradigm, before we can end. SubhanAllah, whenever I get this Ember alert, um, I remember Yusuf Ali Islam, SubhanAllah. And this is seven year old. One of the narrations says Yusuf Ali Islam was seven year old uh, when he was taken away uh, and separated from his father. May Allah SWT help this family. Ameen, Ya Rab. Um, so, last, last paradigm. So, first paradigm we discussed, second paradigm we discussed, the final paradigm. Final paradigm is. So first paradigm was about sexuality, second paradigm was about gender identity, third paradigm is about basically is about sex. There are two extremes in the West regarding sex. And Islam comes in, the, in between to, pro, to provide a balanced approach how you see this animalistic characteristic, what we call sex. One extreme that have idolized sex, the other extreme which have demonized sex. The philosophical term is hedonism and monasticism. <clears throat> so in the West, if you have, if you're a Catholic and if you want to be a priest or pastor, can you marry someone? No, because St. Augustine, it's very evident in his writing, he said sex is an evil, but it's a necessary evil because it, you are required to do for, for the reproduction. So even St. Augustine says that those couple who, Christian couple who are married, they should not engage in unnecessary sex unless you want to reproduce. Because it's a necessary evil, it comes out from an animalistic characteristic. How, why you want to do this? It takes you away from it. Because in Catholicism, sex is evil and sex is disconnected with the spirituality. Is that clear? That's one extreme. Sex is demonized. Sex is considered evil. On the other extreme, on the other extreme you have people who have idolized sex. Because when you go to the one extreme, you will have response of the other extreme. People will swing like pendulum. Sigmund Freud mentality. Moranist mentality. The people who have an allergic reaction from this ex extreme version of Catholicism. They say no. Sex and spirituality are disconnected. But sex is the purpose of my life. And spirituality or God or morality or religion does not have any right to interfere in my sexual life. Are you following brothers and sisters? Both will say sex and spirituality are disconnected. They will say, you can do whatever you want, fulfill your sexual desire. And they would say, sex is evil. They have idolized sex. Sigmund Freud said that this is the highest objective of my life. And Catholics will say this is evil. Did you see the conflict? By the way, if I have to ask you why Catholics and Christ Christians would see sex as an evil, any idea? Yes.
Ja. Yeah. Let's go back even before Alexandria and before Pope and before Paul and before St. Peter. Let's go back to the original central figures of Christianity. Who are the central figures of Christianity? Maryam, Isa, and John the Baptist. Zachariah, right? John, did he get married? No. Mary, did he get married? Jesus, did he get married? So all the central figures of Christianity, they never marry once. Yeah, yeah. They never get married once. They never. Now, when did it happen? Some of these figures like Jesus, later on they started considering him as a God or son of God, right? Then they have to play around the hermeneutical system of Bible. And eventually the maximum allowed monogamy. And even for the priest and pastor, that's not possible. So, and Allah actually commented on this. How many of you remember Surah Hadith? Surah Hadith. Allah says, وَرَحْبَانِيَّةَ نِبْتَدَعُوهَا and talking about Christians, Allah says, and monasticism is something which they have invented themselves. We never commanded them to do so. Allahu Akbar. So this is life of monasticism. This is how, okay. Now Islam comes. I'll finish inshallah. Islam comes, Islam, one extreme you have, Catholicism, it considered relationship as evil. Second, you have Freudists, modernists, they would consider relationship as idol. This purpose of life. That's why I'm living Friday night. I have to go and fulfill my desires. Or Saturday night. Right? Now, yeah, I have to see the wine guys on Saturday, that's what I'm saying. Okay, now, when it comes, when it comes to the, when it comes to the Islam, first of all, does Islam see sex in and of itself as evil? Islam see that if your relationship is coming with your spouse, it is very healthy and it's an act of ibadah. It's not evil, it's actually positive, but if it's coming with the divine restriction. Islam turned that and make it a very healthy thing and Islam puts restriction so that our families can thrive. And then Islam gave guidelines so that Islam connected this relationship with spirituality. There's a dua which we are being told whenever we are engaged in this relationship to ask, Allahumma jannibna shaitan wa jannibna shaitani ma razaqtana. Can you imagine Mufti Taqi Usmani, one of the famous scholars of Pakistan, he was explaining this hadith and he was saying we are being we are engaging in that relationship and we are being asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the devil so it shows that this action is not devilish this action is not evil if it is done in a proper way subhanallah and who will remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before fulfill this desire? It means we have connected in Islamic discourse, we connected this relationship with ibadah. Can you imagine this? And that's what Rasulullah said in Sahih Muslim, that for every relationship you will get reward. And Sahaba says, Rasulullah, how can for this relationship you will get reward? And Rasulullah said, that if you will do this in a haram way, will you get a sin? Sahaba said, yes. He said, why? You will get reward if you do it in a halal way. Because it's in Islam, we just give the paradigm shift. It's not evil. It's ibadah if it's done in a proper way with your spouse. But yes, Islam is very conservative in the regard if you are not following divine guidance, then it is considered super haram. And Islam took some practical steps to protect you at the individual level, at the community level, even at the criminal law level to stop you from this kind of relationship. Now it makes sense everything. And that is why I will end here. That is why in the modern West, they don't understand those are hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking a spouse that you will be spiritually accountable if you are saying no to your spouse for the relationship. Because Allah connected sex and spirituality together. Rasulullah said this in a hadith. And now you will be held spiritually accountable. This hadith is mentioned in Muslim. If you will say no without any reason to your spouse. In the West, who believe in personal bodily autonomy, my body, my choice, they will think, that no, we have a right to say no. But now, you will be held spiritually accountable. You don't have a right because you went into this relationship to protect the fabric of each other. You have a responsibility. So when you were going to fit Islam into the Western paradigm, you were going to change Islam, you will have issues. When you are presenting Islam, present it as an unfiltered, organic Islam. This is it, what it is. If you cannot understand it, it's because you are indoctrinated 
with some man-made philosophies. Let me deconstruct that. Is that clear? There are many more things I can say. Read my book, inshallah. You will get um, uh, under these headings. You will get more details, inshallah. I will end because it's 10. If you have any questions, inshallah, we can take. Otherwise, we will pray, inshallah. Any questions?